Hello, and you are listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston, a project of SoCal 350 Climate Action. Our show presents environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame featuring voices not necessarily heard on mainstream media. Eco Justice Radio acknowledges that we record the show on the traditional territory of the Tongva and all of their relatives. Welcome, I am Jessica Aldridge. On today's show, Eco Justice Radio executive producer Jack Eid will be sharing speeches and discussions from multiple street actions on national and international climate, environmental, and social justice issues. The main action we feature is in solidarity with the indigenous people's fight of the coastal gas link pipeline now under construction on the west coast of Canada. We present a speech from climate scientist Peter Kalmus on building the movement for a stable climate. We also share testimony from movie writer and director Adam McKay on the recent film Don't Look Up and his calls for the Hollywood film and music industry to divest from City National Bank and their parent company, the Royal Bank of Canada, who are funding the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline. We also hear from indigenous and environmental rights activist Lydia Ponce, as well as a number of youth activists from the Youth Climate Strike, the Sunrise Movement, and Extinction Rebellion. Thank you for tuning in to Eco Justice Radio and our show Solidarity Actions on Climate Justice, Stopping Pipelines and Dirty Banks, with special host and our executive producer, Jack Eit. Welcome to Eco Justice Radio. We hear a lot about climate change these days, and some even are calling it a form of hysteria. The single focus of carbon emissions get pointed to, but we know the environmental problems facing planet Earth go well beyond these complex processes. Nevertheless, let us see if we can agree that ecosystems and biodiversity everywhere are destroyed by global economic systems. As some key species go extinct, entire ecosystems like coral reefs and forests will collapse, and communities of humans live next to the chemical plants, refineries, ports, and freeways, breathing the toxic air, drinking the despoiled water. The instigator of the problem is the cycle of endless growth and profit by billionaires and their corporations invested through Wall Street banks without consideration for people and ecosystems. The result is destruction. The guilty behavior is the drilling, transportation, processing, and burning of fossil fuels. The vector is carbon emissions. And the result is, to use the term anthropogenic, that's human-caused, climate disruption that no one will be able to escape. We again are seeing street protests about the connections between climate and environmental collapse and investment in fossil fuel production that despoils land, water, and indigenous and frontline communities. It also ends up heating the planet through continued carbon emissions. Our show today features a climate scientist, Peter Kalmus, a filmmaker, Adam McKay, from the recent movie Don't Look Up, an activist friend of the show, Lydia Ponce, from Society of Native Nations and SoCal 350, and a list of other activists who have shown up to speak out against a frack gas pipeline development in Canada, the Coastal Gas Link, cited through indigenous unceded Wet'suwet'en territory financed by the Royal Bank of Canada and their subsidiary, City National Bank. First up is another friend of the show, Peter Kalmus, who we interviewed in 2019 about his book, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. He's an amazing climate scientist and activist. Hi, everyone. So first, I got to say I'm speaking on my own behalf. Okay, so we do not need Earth Day. We need Global Earth Rebellion. This is a rebirth for Extinction Rebellion. I told you guys a few months ago that reinforcements were coming, and oh boy, did they come in the form of Scientist Rebellion. It is critical for scientists to start taking a stand. If we know that the science is this earth-shattering, right, that we're heading towards a catastrophe, how can we stay in papers, how can we stay giving dry academic talks? 
This threatens all of us, this threatens our kids, and we are getting out into the streets, and we will not stop. So look at all that's happening around the world, from the Scientist Rebellion, to the XR New York City Spring Rebellion, to the coal barren blockade, to the amazing Just Stop Oil Youth, and the last generation over in Europe. We are entering into a global Earth Rebellion, we need to join all of this together and make it grow and make it get big and make it get unstoppable. And we are on the right side of history. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuel. That's from the person who's got the most claim to being the leader of the planet, right? The UN Secretary General. The recent IPCC report clearly says that we gotta stop all new fossil fuel projects and immediately peak global emissions and begin the equitable reduction in order to even have a chance of two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. But the IPCC also makes it painfully clear that two degrees Celsius will be catastrophic. Antonio Guterres, the UN uh, Secretary General, also said, investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. Net zero by 2050 is complete incrementalist bull The fossil fuel industry loves the concept of direct air capture because it provides greenwashing shield for them. They love by 2050 because it's so far in the future as to be completely meaningless. We are in a genuine emergency. We need to ramp down and end the fossil fuel industry as fast as we possibly can. We need to ramp down and end the beef and animal ag industry as fast as we possibly can. We need to end this insane colonial extractivist wealth disparity between the rich and the poor, the global north and the global south, the least affected people and the most affected people as fast as we possibly can. We need to ramp down all the stuff that's irreversibly destroying Earth's life support extremely fast and in an equitable way. Fossil fuel executives have been lying for decades in order to make astronomical profits, more money than any human could possibly use for anything other than capturing our political and media systems and destroying the planet. And they have knowingly led us to the brink of civilizational collapse. They should not be profiting off of the transition away from fossil fuels. They should be in prison. And their assets, thank you, they should be. They've, they've completely ripped up into shreds the social contract that we all rely on, right? We have to stop the social license of fossil fuel. They, they've literally been lying for decades. I think all of their assets should be seized. We should collectivize fossil fuels, which are still precious as we navigate this historical transition to becoming part of the web of life, a balanced human existence. So by that I mean we can't end fossil fuels overnight. It's going to take a few years, and we have to use them in an equitable way to power the transition away from them, if that makes sense. We need to navigate this historical transition to becoming part of the web of life. We, ha we have to transition into a balanced human existence. We could then ration the supply and control the price of fossil fuels so that this transition falls on the backs of the rich who have done the most to cause it and not on the backs of the poor who have done the least. The climate activists who courageously risk their careers, their freedoms, and their bodies in civil disobedience and all those who support them are heroes. We are on the right side of history. May the Global Earth Rebellion grow. May everyone around the world join us in love and in rage. Thank you very much. Second up is writer-director Adam McKay, introduced by Jay Ponte, one of the main event organizers. When I saw the movie, has anyone seen the movie Don't Look Up? Have you seen that? I can tell you that there's never been a movie in my life that has connected more deeply with what I experience as a climate activist to show the failure of the media, the failure of our governments, 
to address the urgent nature of climate change. And today we have the climate clock uh, sent us. There is a clock that is in real time counting down to the countdown that the IPCC has given us. Just like Jennifer Lawrence had the diet app. We have one of those for real. That movie is our lives. And so we reached out to Adam and I asked him for his support. He's here for us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce Adam McKay. I'm here today because honestly, about four or five years ago, I had a bolt of fear hit me like I have never experienced in my life. I read the IPCC report about three, four years ago. I read Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. And I'm lucky enough to have a job where I get to talk to people outside of a normal sort of nine to five schedule. So I started calling scientists and I said, I must be missing something. And every one of these climate scientists told me that, no, I'm not. That this is not a story that is about 80 years from now, 100 years from now, 50 years from now. It is now. And what I never understood was that when I was hearing about the climate crisis for decades past, I always thought that that was the thing, that it was 100 years from now. And having done press all around the world for this movie, what I encounter over and over again is that whether it's the media, whether it's our leaders, whether it's average people, somehow the idea that the climate crisis is now has not penetrated. And I, I, it's incredible. We, five million people a year are dying from excess heat, according to a recent Lan Lancet study. We're already living in a climate that human beings have never lived in. We're, as you guys know, we're at 422 parts per million greenhouse gases. And then you talk about the mechanisms that make this happen, the mechanisms that are killing us, that are literally going to kill us. And you look at the banks and you look at the companies and you look at the boardrooms that every day show up to work to kill us. And you see their bland faces as they just look at that stock price rise. And you see our culture that is so dedicated to profit that when we say the ship is listing, what do they say to us? Buy Dramamine. When we say the house is full of smoke, what do they say to us? Light some incense. I'll sell you some. And this happens over and over again. We live in a, a world, I mean, America is the epicenter of it, but we live in a world where everything is so profitized that no one can even tell you that we're killing the livable climate without it, without it selling ad space. And then when you get to this story, this particular story that we're here for today, and you look at a massive bank like the Bank of Canada that wants to run a pipeline through sovereign holy land from indigenous people because they gotta keep that stock price going up. And you just wonder, who are these people in these boardrooms? How do you go to sleep at night? And you look at what the Sacklers did, killing 500,000 people from opioid overdoses. And you think about the scarlet letter that these people in these boardrooms, these CEOs of these oil companies, these banks, these companies, you think about the size of the scarlet letter they're gonna wear from the millions and millions of deaths, and it makes the Sacklers look like a tasteful brooch compared to what these people are gonna deal with. So I wanna say to the CEOs of these banks, to the people on these boards, to the CFOs, to the people that are making more money than they need just so they can have a vacation house or a pretty car. Is this really worth it? Do you really feel good about yourself destroying indigenous land, Trump traipsing all over thousands of years of heritage and religion to pump poison that will kill all of us? It's very rare in life that you see something this patently evil.
I mean, this is just bad on every single level. So I call for anyone who's hearing this, take five minutes, read about the climate crisis, take five minutes, look at these banks. We need divestment across the board. All banks should be divesting from fossil fuel the same way they did with apartheid in South, in South Africa, the same way they divest from supposedly Ukraine, although plenty of corporations are still there. We need moral decisions for the greater good. And we gotta let the stock prices go. And that's why we're here today. We're here today for the health of our climate. We're here today for our history, our legacy. We're here today for all the people of the world. And as Mark said earlier, like it's rare that you get something this cartoonishly evil. As, as a screenwriter, I can tell you, you would never write something this evil. It would be over the top, even for Batman. So City National Bank is a bank that I've used for years. And unless they deal with this, I'm gone. Uh, I know, I, I'm gone, I'm gone. It will be a hassle, but I'm gone. And, and when it comes to Canada and the companies up there, I'm already boycotting a lot of those companies. And it, when it comes to the indigenous people that are being overrun by this poisonous CO2 methane gas business that we're looking at, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lay down for you. We're all here for you. This is the issue that we should all be all in on. And uh, thank you so much for showing up today and solidarity and let's keep fighting. Let's hear more about the situation in British Columbia and the ongoing protest against construction of the 416 mile fracked gas coastal gas link pipeline with actor and activist Mark Ruffalo and Slado Molly Wickham, the spokesperson for the Gitimitin checkpoint on Wet'suwet'en territory in Canada. They are calling for divestment from the Royal Bank of Canada and their subsidiary, City National Bank, if they don't stop funding this project and others like it. Film and music industry signatories to the letter include Scarlett Johansson, Taika Waititi, Robert Downey Jr., and many more. This from the website nomoredirtybanks.com. Right now, major banks like the Royal Bank of Canada are financing a fracked gas pipeline bulldozing through the land of the Wet'suwet'en Nation in northern British Columbia, Canada. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs never consented to this pipeline construction through their territories, which would risk the sacred headwaters of the Wazinkwa River. But here's where it gets complicated. The Supreme Court of Canada recognized Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs as rightful title holders of the land. But corporations still get away with consulting only elected leadership put in place by the colonial government and not the rightful title holders. Now what makes this even more urgent is a recent militarized police violence by the Canadian police, the RCMP. For the last three years, and as recently as last November, the RCMP violently arrested and detained non-violent indigenous land defenders and journalists. Publicly, RBC makes grand commitments to respect indigenous rights, ethical investing, and climate action promises. But not only is RBC funding this pipeline to the tune of $315 million, it is the linchpin to a $6.5 billion loan backed by 26 other banks. Even though RBC has made commitments to indigenous human rights, they continue to fund coastal gas links violence against the Wet'suwet'en people. This is our land, our sacred headwaters, Wutsinkwa, which is the lifeblood of our entire nation. CGL is racing to complete drilling to microtunnel under the Wutsinkwa without the consent of the hereditary chiefs. RBC's financial ties to this project make them responsible for endangering our drinking water, our salmon, and criminalizing us as Wet'suwet'en people on our own land. 
Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. Today, you are listening to Solidarity Actions on Climate Justice, Stopping Pipelines and Dirty Banks, with host Jack Eid presenting multiple speakers from the climate justice movement. Lydia Ponce from Society of Native Nations and SoCal 350 put the climate and environmental justice struggle in a world where profit-obsessed multinational capital rules in perspective. Lydia Ponce, Mayo Quechua, I live on the unceded territories of the Tongva people, Nona Sagna, and I give thanks and gratitude to all their relatives in the four directions of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern California. When you talk about the extractive industries, you know, it's easy to see the relationship of the echo side that's happening and the femicide that continues globally and locally in these nations, these so-called divided states of America. What divides us is the idea of who should have and afford rights, human or otherwise, uh, civil or constitutional. It's, it's all a ruse for me as an indigenous woman, as a, as a human, because the farce and everything started back with Manifest Destiny and with, <laughs> with the, uh, dis- the disco- doctrines of discovery. So when you ask the question about how to make this right for climate justice, climate, racial, social, economic justice, which would be environmental justice for everyone, it's, it seemingly appears to be too late. However, it isn't because we've always had the tools and um, nobody, dis- nobody agrees on how to be better relatives. Nobody agrees on getting down to the nucleus of either we're causing harm and hurting or we're part of the healing. And for those of us who are in the circles of environmental work and trying to coexist with nature, I don't know anybody who's profiting from extractive industries and the people who maintain those jobs are the blue collar workers here in Los Angeles and the, and even in our port are full of fear and don't know how to transition for the few select that are ready to change to something a lot more um, and the healing track of knowing that it's not sustainable oil and desalination and fracking and all of it including the new promise of green hydrogen, it's all poisoning and hurting and causing harm to our earth mother. And so when it comes to these big banks and Wall Street, mostly run by colonized generations of white cis hetero fragile males, you know, we have to pull them into the circle, the community circle and the thought of how much harm they're causing because these things that happen these diseases and, and these sicknesses globally, locally, we're causing harm to the air, to the water, to the land. And of course, it's going to be causing harm to the people and to all of our other relatives. So if you still have your bank uh, as one of these larger corporations, these corporate pimps that are oppressing, hurting and raping and pillaging our mother, our earth mother, then why? I have to ask why we, we have to divest and get to public banking and or to credit unions, because essentially all our dollars, our mortgages and car payments and all of these things, these loans are tied into femicide. And we're seeing it with Roe versus Wade and that enslavement of having uh, women being forced to do the will of the government and what we should do with our bodies. It's the same thing as the body of our, our mother, this place we call home as earth and she has rights and when she is recognized as having rights by nature by her right as women we would all um, know a different kind of equity and be uh, viewed as the same as any other person walking this planet including the colonized founding fathers from long ago who wrote these documents that don't have any honor for anything but profit for their own pockets lining their their pockets with profits So we still have tribal people who don't have running water. We still have tribal people who don't have electricity. And we have to put teeth into tribal consent, which we first have to have tribal consultation. And that doesn't mean speaking to the 
tribal people who are going to say yes, with all due respect, it has to be within the tribal nations and how they're connected, land, water, and territories and areas, shared spaces that connect us. And when we're speaking about the shared spaces that connect us, that includes you and me, Jack, we uh, and Jessica, that includes all of us because the waters connect us. They do not divide us from this side of our, our backyard to the other side of the world, this planet. All the waters, from what I know, um, have been touched by something that's not of, of a natural state. I'm reading reports of the water losing memory, and I'm afraid to even ask what, what is water remembering now? You know, um, if, it's, if it's losing its memory, what's the content and the value of this life-giving force, this source, this medicine? And I'm concerned for everyone, I, I, even the hard-headed and the hard-hearted. And um, I think that we need to be prepared to be uncomfortable and really inconvenienced if we're going to do something right by our mother. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I hope that um, we all become better relatives to everything around us, including the dogs that are trained to get extra cookies when I'm on the Zoom. (laughs) Here is an excerpt of the documentary, Your Voice, Our Future from the office of the Wet'suwet'en on the similar struggler in in 2011 against a different pipeline, the Northern Gateway Tar Sands, by Enbridge, which was rejected by all the First Nations and eventually by the government of Canada. I was there when we first received contact from from Enbridge. We listened to them all. Uh, We had many meetings with Enbridge. They were very forceful in the beginning. They're talking about trying to put it through, but they, the First Nations say no to it. My grandmother fought for this at the courthouse and won the case. When we take on chiefly titles, we have a responsibility to look after that land the same as it looks after us. Now when we get encroachment of a proposed pipeline coming in to threaten this beautiful river, Wet'sinkwa, That threatens our way of life, that threatens our culture, threatens our future. Without the uh, the land, we cannot teach the history of the land as it used to be. Without the land, we cannot continue to live as we do today. And I think what we have in the state that it's in is far more valuable. There's not possibilities, it's just when. If the pipeline breaks, it'll, sh- it'll harm nature, it'll harm our way of life, it'll harm our food, and most of all, it'll harm our water, which is in short- shortage in- on Earth now. Back to the street protest calling for City National Bank to divest from fossil fuel pipelines that violate Indigenous sovereignty. We hear co-MC George Funmaker from Red Earth Defense introduce Kaya Chowdhury, and then co MC Stephanie Mushrush introduces Sim Bilal from Youth Climate Strike Los Angeles. Kea Shadari, Extinction Rebellion Youth National Coordinator. Hi. We stand here as a collective in solidarity and respect for the Wet'suwet'en people and all our Indigenous relatives who are suffering at the hands of the world, like Canada and City National and all the other banks and corporations and governments in control. And that anger that we have for them, that we should have for them, is powerful. Anger and joy are both such dynamic tools of resistance. And I really feel that love and anger are inherently simultaneous. So when we fight, we fight for love and rage. I was 16 years old, um, and I haven't been organizing that long. It's been like just over a year for me in the climate world. And I don't know why I ever thought that the laws would handle it, that the people with wealth and power would handle it. I assumed that they had it under control just because they have control. Greenwashing, indigenous washing of the coastal gas lake pipeline has been absurd. You know what they said? They said, quote, 
that a strong oil and gas sector is key for indigenous education and prosperity. What a paradox. And we're all here, of course, because of the reality that the bank doesn't care, because powerful industries never have. There's this manufactured illusion that we don't need support, but we do. See, our movements should be led by those who are vulnerable, those who are most impacted by the systems of oppression that need abolition, but not with all the weight resting on their shoulders. Because so often we hear, listen to your indigenous friends, your black friends, your disabled friends, let them tell you what to do. They say that the youth are the future and we are forced to fight because we so desperately need to. We're always burdened with repairing these damages. The Wet'suwet'en leaders are putting their bodies and their hearts on the front line to bring growth and the mere fact that they need to, the mere fact that we need to be fighting this fight says so much. And the fight is draining and we need to be able to acknowledge just how hard it is. It should be okay to say that we don't want to do it because ultimately it's not really our choice. But we're all here together for a reason, because we want to act and we need to for ourselves and our communities, which is why we need this, why we need each other. And this, this is why solidarity exists. We learn from one another, we listen to one another, we live from one another. Collectivism is a really interesting thing, I feel like, because collectivism does not mean equality. Collectivism is what we have here, a community of stories. And this amazing little community here, gathered in the heart of Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Tonga Land, Carolina Land, Quiche Land, on this tiny little bit of earth. And I know we all feel this energy being here, being present in the moment. We have a beautiful, magical, collective blossom. And so much goes without saying. Thank you. Give it up for Kea. Thank you, sister. Um, next, we're going to be having Sim Bilal come up. Uh, he's an organizer uh, from the Youth Climate Strike LA. So please welcome Sim. Uh, what's up, everyone? My name is Sim. I'm an organizer with Youth Climate Strike Los Angeles, and I was born and raised in South LA. I'm here today because I want to deliver a message of solidarity with everyone fighting for their right to life. I hope my words, my intention, my youth, and my spirit will aid in this struggle. I understand it's easy to get overwhelmed with fear and paralyzed with guilt. I have, I'm being honest, I hit a new rock bottom every three to six months. There are times I'm hopeless. You see, the issue my community is facing is that we're surrounded by oil wells and freeways. We're impoverished, and instead of uplifting each other, we continue to prey on each other. I know too many people who have fallen victim to gang violence, gun violence, police brutality, and state sanctioned violence. I didn't think I would make it to my 18th birthday, but I did. And I had another birthday, and another birthday after that. Now see, the reason I keep advancing in my life, and I take each year of my life as an advancement, is because I have community. I'm surrounded by people who love me and uplift me. Now, I would not be here today if it wasn't for the investment of these people around me. Now see, the odds are stacked against me, just like they're stacked against the who win just like they're stacked against us when we're actively fighting against this climate crisis. We're all facing the same white supremacist, capitalistic, imperialist billionaires. And yet, in spite of this, I believe that we will win. I believe that the Wets of Witten will win. I am confident. I am confident because I am living proof of the power that comes from community. I am living proof of the power that comes when we invest in each other and we take our wins as collective wins. So, to the Wets of Witten, to the people fighting for your right to life, you have community with us here in Los Angeles, in Tonga Land, with all of us in the, around the world. And your, your struggle, we are with you, we see you, we fight with you in solidarity. Here is more from the documentary by the Wet'suwet'en on their successful fight against the Northern Gateway Tar Sands Pipeline that was slated to go through their land just as the coastal gas link is now. So all the time that, that the chief's table was negotiating with them, our staff were out there gathering information. We also uh, had meetings with um, the Gixan people, with uh, the Niska, with Haisla. We need to know that there will never be a pipeline break. 
that would damage the water, that would damage the land. <laughs> With that, they took a stand, and they took a stand that they would not support the, uh, the progression of the uh, pipeline uh, going through our territory. Sotan culture basically is based on is through the land, through the rivers, through the fish, through the moose, through the bear, everything. What Sotan culture is uh, is not found in the archives. It's not lost. We've retained and held on to our hereditary social and governance structure, and our culture is alive today. <laughs> around here because of the mountains and the widespread area and all the fishing, hunting you can do around here too. The hunting that we do on the land, the berry picking that we do in the summertime, the gathering of herbal medicinal plants that we use, and the fact that we can gather out on our territory as a family, as a clan, as a house, would be destroyed. I'm so proud to be Wet'suwet'en, and uh, I'm, I'm so proud and honored that uh, we've held on to our traditional way of governing ourselves and our identity. I believe in the three L's, our law, our language, and our land. And if we lose one, we lose a part of our culture. And also, the land we're on, the territory we're on, is very sacred. Um, with the canyon, it's, actually, it's also like a spiritual place. Like, I was taught when I go on the bridge, I always start with the, where the river is leaving. And I stand there and I let like all my, my like, bad energy go, like if I'm mad, I'll let it go. The canyon's really important to me because that's where we get our source of fish and when like when I'm going off to college next year I'm gonna need that. I'm gonna like I'm not gonna live off of nothing, you know? I'll have the source of fish there, I'd have like canned fish and smoked fish and whatever. So it's really important because that's one of our ways of survival. I really have a lot of memories of how we preserved food from the land, the berries, and how my grandma used to take, our, take us out to make medicine plants. We learned a lot as we were growing up. The only thing that's left on using our territories is to use it as a school. This is our school, our university. It's a refrigerator. It's it's what makes us us. Learning about their territory, learning the language, learning the culture, learning the traditions of the Wet'suwet'en people. That is invaluable to my people. The salmon and the rivers that we have are pristine. And I think if you look anywhere else in the world, they don't have anything like what we do. And I know for a fact that the Wet'suwet'en provide a lot of uh, food for the year to not only their families, but to outlying areas around here. This uh, river uh, runs a long ways. It's uh, very valuable water for um, not just a First Nation, for uh, food, for salmon. Water is our food. It's very important for our uh, economy, building our economy with our, our local business. Um, down the road, what we have now is going to probably bring us more money and jobs if we manage it properly. 
บาเปลี่ยนเลกเอาเวอาเนจเยวกเสิ When big companies like Enbridge comes into an area, they bring in their own machinery. They bring in all their qualified workers. There, there would be very little Joe jobs that would go to our people. They promise you jobs. It all sounds good, but in the final analysis, it's not that way at all. You look around our valley, the pristine valley, which now I appreciate. I took it for granted for many, many years. You can walk and have fresh air, and our waters are clean. And I want it to stay like that for not only for me, but for our grandchildren. Yang ka ko jo eu ai yo ko de au que ane wano se. What would a pipeline do to our country, to our land? It will destroy it. It will pollute it. Not only that, <clears throat> there won't be no more culture. There won't be no land to live off of. There won't no be no moose. There might not be no fish. Right at its very origin, the tar sands are already having a negative impact on on our brothers and sisters, the Cree out there. What really bothers me is that how how that fluids that going to go be going through that pipeline, how volatile it is. And how toxic it is for, uh, in case of a, when it breaks, the the devastation to the land and to to the environment. Whatever man builds is going to break. <laughs> Hey listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. Today, you are listening to Solidarity Actions on Climate Justice, Stopping Pipelines and Dirty Banks, with host Jack Eid presenting multiple speakers from the climate justice movement. Back to the Solidarity protest, we heard from Josiah Edwards of Sunrise Movement Los Angeles. As was mentioned before, it happened at Standing Rock. And it's not going to stop until... Those who are at the root of power understand that they have a responsibility to future generations and to the indigenous people of that land, that they must end the exploitation of their land. That begins when they stop funding it, when they stop allowing themselves to be implicitly responsible for violence, death, and destruction. Now family, we know that's wrong. So why do they continue to do it? One, because they don't care. And secondly, because they like to put profits over people. And that's the foremost problem we face today. Young people have been organizing for years now to demand an end to the fossil fuel industry, a just transition, and ensure indigenous sovereignty, not just in the United States and not just in Canada, but across the land. Now let's be clear, we should be actually referring to it as Turtle Island, which is actually what it's about, right? Until there is an end to that exploitation, we will continue to fight. Young people have a responsibility to do so because it is our futures that are at risk. And foremost, the reason we are fighting isn't just because our futures are the ones that are at risk, but secondary, but actually most importantly, because there are people who have been doing this long before us. We stand on the shoulders of the giants who have continued to fight. The land protectors with West Wetton, if it weren't for their fight, we wouldn't be here at all. If it weren't for the fight to the folks at Standing Rock, we wouldn't be here at all. If it weren't for the fight in the place we call Los Angeles, we wouldn't be here at all. If it weren't for the fight of indigenous people who, who understand what it is to take care of the land, we wouldn't be here at all. If it weren't for the knowledge that they had passed down generation after generation, we wouldn't be here at all. If it weren't for our understanding of what they have done throughout history, we wouldn't be here at all. Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, 
youth climate strike, all the folks who have been, all the young people who have been demanding a change for our futures. It's only because of the shoulders we stand on that we are able to demand such change. Now let's be very clear. The people who are at fault, the bankers, the Royal Bank of Canada, who is funding City National Bank, the parent company, they need to put an end to the exploitation of the Wet'suwet'en people and their land. That's why we're out here today. Earlier, we started with an action. They didn't think, no, we'd show up a little early, but we did because we knew they would shut the doors after the fact. We don't play nice. It's not a game. Our lives and the lives of our families and friends, our communities, our futures are at risk. We didn't come to play. For the remainder of the event today, I want y'all to bring the same energy y'all bring to every other action and every other instance where we demand climate justice, where we demand justice for all people. Because as we know, climate justice is racial justice, is economic justice, is labor justice, is gender justice, is LGBTQ plus justice. This is an intersectional fight. And right now, the West Wetton really need our help. They need our support. I want to give an appreciation to the celebrities who have made their demands very clear, standing in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en, saying that it is time for City National Bank to divest and stop funding the exploitation of that land and to stop funding the violence, the police violence that is caused because of that explo exploited land. I want to say thank you to Meryl Streep, Adam McKay, Brian Cox, Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert Downing Jr., Julianne Moore, Bill McKibben, Michelle Pfeiffer, all of the folks who signed on to that letter demanding that their bank, City National Bank, put an end and divest from fossil fuels, divest from this pipeline, and actually invest in the futures of young people and in the futures of indigenous people who have been fighting for us to prevent this climate crisis. It's only because of that work that we have an opportunity to actually prevent an end to this, uh, prevent this crisis. Do y'all hear me? Yes. It is time, it is time that we see an end to this crisis, period. So thank you to the celebrities who have put, them, put their names out there and said it is time for City National Bank to end where they're at. It's time for the Royal Bank of Canada to stop thinking that they can get away with this mess. It's time for all of us to rise up against climate injustice. It's time for all of us to rise up in solidarity against indigenous exploitation. It's time for all of us to put an end to the climate crisis once and for all. So I want to thank y'all for having me here today. We're going to have a wonderful program as we move forward. And then at the end of it, we'll be moving directly towards City National Bank to make our demands heard once again. Thank you very much. Writer-director of the film Don't Look Up and The Big Short then chatted with us and other reporters about capitalism. What we learned with The Big Short is there's a concept on Wall Street called last man out. And what it means is you squeeze every profit you can out of a moment knowing that you'll be out of the boardroom. You'll be out of your CFO position. You'll be out of your, and you have your money and you can move on. And I, I really think that's what's driving this climate suicide that we're living in right now. So that's capitalism. That's unchecked capitalism. We need some profit motive. But that is what's happened with capitalism right now in our world today, is that it is totally unchecked. So you have a lot of boardrooms that are just, let's get the money now and get out of here. So last man out is literally killing mankind. I'm aware of how money works, and and it's a, uh, you know, the way currency is created, it's based on a collective fate, and I think that's one of the reasons you've seen all this cryptocurrency become very popular, is because there's a lot of loss of faith in our governance because they've been corrupted by big money, and it's a scary situation because 
at this moment, we need collective action more than we've ever had it before. This is the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is the bombing of London times a million, the climate crisis. And that's not me being hyperbolic. If you look at the science, it's very clear. One further installment from the documentary Your Voice, Our Future, a Wet'suwet'en perspective on the now-canceled Enbridge Northern Gateway Tar Sands oil pipeline that was proposed through their land in northern British Columbia, Canada. Who's to say that that pipe is going to stay good forever? You know, there's going to be a time where it's going to deteriorate. It's a living water, and it's clean water, and uh, this is part of our lifestyle. You know, the threat of a, even one oil spill would be devastating. In our Canadian part, it would be like a really big hazard to us, because all of our fish would be going away, and that fish is like the main resource in the Dillican territory right now. It's, it doesn't take a spill, just the construction alone has the potential to impact salmon habitat, um, the rearing areas, the water quality uh, for the fish. Digging a trench to put the pipeline in disturbs all of this. It disturbs the entire ecosystem. When the ecosystem is disturbed, the Wet'suwet'en are disturbed. When you remove a piece of the land, when you remove a piece of your soul, it disturbs the Wet'suwet'en so much that fractures happen. What holds us together is our culture, our land, and the belief that we will always be here as long as we look after the land itself. The endangerment of the wildlife, the fish, the creeks, the lakes, the rivers will be all impacted. And the end result is our health. It's going to uh, affect the wildlife, is what I'm thinking about. It's quite the act activity going on out there when the person <clears throat> takes the time to study the, the animals. Yeah, all the different animals, they all have their own trails. And they, they don't disturb other uh, trails that other animals use. I worry about the moose and the deer and where the few elk that is around in the north. Where we are right now, we're standing above the Wet'suwet'en River itself at its pure, as pure as you can get it. It comes straight from the Maurice River in, into the Bulkley and from the Bulkley into the Skeena. So it's a very major part of the Skeena River system itself. And the fish that go through the Skeena from the ocean are affected by anything that happens to this river. That's why it's so important that we don't let anything happen to our rivers because it affects everybody downstream. If you look at this river, you can see that it's flowing rather quickly right through this area. This is our life's blood. This is our food. This is where our food comes from. And you, you have a oil break on, along this line that they're proposing to put in. There's no way you're going to put a booming materials across here and say that you're going to stop that oil from flowing further down in the river. This river flows into, you know, the Skeena River, which meets up further down the line, and it's going to flow right to the ocean, and you're not going to be able to stop it. It's braided. There's lots of log jams. It's, it's a lot of critical habitat for a lot of different species for us, and we're worried about that. We have a word for our territory, and, it, and it, it's yinta. But it's not just a word, it's almost a philosophy. And it not only refers to a territory, but the territory is comprised of the trees, the soil, the insects, the birds, the fish, the water, and also human beings. And each action affects another, another component. Something that happens in the water will affect the bugs. The bugs, and what happens to them, they feed the fish, and, and, and there's chain reaction. In 1997, there was a ruling handed down by the Supreme Court of Canada that stated that the Wet'suwet'en have rights and title to land. The court case was called the Delgamukkasteway court case. 
And the one part of the decision that I wanted to speak on was uh, the right of the Wet'suwet'en and the Gixan people to be consulted regarding any kind of development on the territories. Not one or two meetings. There had to be consultation with the chief's table, with the communities. The Wet'suwet'en, like the Gitsan, have laws. Laws of the land, laws of conduct, and ecological laws. For the Wet'suwet'en, it, it's a way of life. Is Yes, we fish, but we need to ensure that the water is clean. Yes, we hunt, but we need to ensure that, that there's food. And uh, yes, we trap, yes, we pick berries, yes, we get our medicines from the territory. And those rights, collectively, are, are uses. And, and title is the management of, of those uses, um, the decision making powers that our clans and our house groups and our Denise and Sakuzite have. Our grandparent, my grandma, fought for it, for us to have the freedom to use the land, our territory, to pick berries or to our, my uncle to go hunting on it, to have the freedom to go do what our, our ancestors did. As long as we know that we have right and title to that land, it gives us the authority to say these are things that can happen on the land and these are things that cannot happen on the land. You have the right to that land. You have the title to that land. Now somebody else has to prove they have the right to give away permits and licenses on your territory. When the Wet'suwet'en say we've never given up that right, we don't intend on giving up that right, and they should not look forward to us allowing projects on our territory that are detrimental to our people, to our culture, and to our lands. Our chiefs, our Denise and Sakazite, have assessed this proposed project according to its Wet'suwet'en principles, and uh, this project does not meet that required criteria. Hey listeners, if you want to check out the extended recording of this show, go to wherever you stream your podcasts or our website, ecojusticeradio.org. This has been Eco Justice Radio and our show, Solidarity Actions on Climate Justice, Stopping Pipelines and Dirty Banks. Thank you to our guests from the climate justice movement, and thank you to our listeners for joining us. Please connect with us on social media at Eco Justice Radio, SoCal 350, and Adventures in Waste. If you like what you heard and you want others to be informed, well, you know what to do. Subscribe to our podcast, post the episodes, and share the important message of our guests. You have been listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston, a project of SoCal 350. The show can be found on kpfk.org, kpft.org, all major podcast apps, and at ecojusticeradio.org. Created by Mark and J.P. Morse, executive producer Jack Eit, co-host and producer Jessica Aldridge, co-host Carrie Kim, and engineer and original music by Blake Quake Beats. And until next time, remember, the power is yours.